Okay, we knew it was going to be a busy day, full service, a lot happening. But I want to tell you about and lay the foundation for a new series that we're going to be starting. It's going to be talking about God. Gee, what an interesting concept, huh? We're going to talk about God. Now, we laugh, but here's what it's going to be. We're going to talk about what is he really like. I mean, who is God? Who is he? We all think we have an idea of what he is. Sometimes he's a formation in a cloud. If you're an AA, he could be a doorknob. <laughs> Interesting, a couple, this was last year, uh, Grant, um, uh, Grant Harrington, thank you, Grant Harrington sent me a picture, and the picture is up here on the trans. Um, he was always wanting to see something kind of mysterious in the clouds, so he was praying about it, and oftentimes he just kind of looks up in the clouds and stuff. And one day he was sitting in his house in the living room, and he got this prompting to go outside and take a picture. So he got up, grabbed his camera, went outside and took a picture. So he sent this picture to me. Now, those of you who know me, you know I'm into skulls. I like skulls. So on the left over there, that's a cool skull. You see the skull? Did you see it before? Or you had to wait until I said it? Okay, well, he sent me that picture. I seen that and I thought, I texted him back. I do text. I said, hey, Grant, thanks, man. That's a pretty cool picture of a skull. That's really cool. He sends me back. No, he said, don't you see Jesus? Look under the sun. Now, this picture doesn't do it real justice, but when you see in the picture, that shiny stuff could, looks like a crown, then you get the eyes, and then his nose, and then the hair, you can see the mouth. Um, this picture is not as good, obviously it's blown up so much, but it, it is, when he, when he sent me back, because I just saw the skull, so he sent me a text back, he says, no, <laughs> Pastor Mike, look under the sun. I see that, I was just like, whoa, that's just really one of those, do do kind of a feeling, you know, it's just kind of really unique. It's kind of wild. Um, you can take it down. The, um, this idea of what is God like? You know, we hear all the time, the scripture tells us that we're supposed to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. We're supposed to honor him. We're supposed to serve him. We're supposed to enjoy him. But our pictures of who he really is will either hinder or help that a lot in what we do. The incredible challenge before us is our perception of who he is. Um, I, had, I asked six people to read a scripture verse or two. Would you guys come up here right now? I asked six of you. You're out there somewhere. Six of you, come on up. Um, I just picked some scriptures that talk about God, God doing things, God moving, God doing whatever. Um, and so when they're, as they're reading the scriptures, what I want you to do is, when, that, when you read that scripture, what picture of God do you get? Okay? So who's first? You are. All right. Tell us, give us the address, and then read the verse. First one is Genesis 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he knew it would be protected by the United States Marine Corps. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Mine's a little off, too. There we go. Is that verse 3? And let God said, let there be light? Oh, yeah. And then God, well, you don't have to. Bring oh, there. Uh, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. There we go. Thank you. I have the second one is Genesis 1, or I'm sorry, Exodus. Hold, hold the mic for a nice close. Okay. There you go. Will do. <laughs> Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descent, descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. One rose among thorns. <laughs> Amos 5, 18 through 20. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. 
as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without a ray of brightness? By the way, it's your very first Sunday here. <laughs> That's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. Who's, who's next? I caught her in the lobby. He says, here, here you go. Come on. Um, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us, gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Perfect. Praise God. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Marvelous. And last but not least... Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Would you give these readers a hand? Thank you guys for reading. It's interesting, our picture and our image of who God is. On one hand, we see him creating, hanging the heavens and the stars in place. We see him acting on behalf of people, bringing deliverance like the children of Israel, bringing healing, doing miracles. And the next minute, we can almost perceive and see him, you know, woe do you say in the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is the day of darkness, the day of vengeance. It's not a good thing. We see God saving, and then in the next minute we see God sending people to hell. Although he doesn't really send people to hell, but our perception is that he's sending people to hell. In his book, Mark, Mark Batterson, in his book, A Lion in a Pit on a Snowy Day or something like that. What's, what's the exact title of that book? You guys around here know that. Come on. Say it again. With a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Okay. The title of his book, Mark Batterson with a lion in a pit on a snowy day. There's one line in there that I read this quite a while ago. I read it, and I remember it just jumped out at me. It's just like, man, I, I believe that, and it's so true. I see it happen in people's lives all the time. The line is this. How you think about God will determine who you become. How you think about God will determine who you become. Same idea and concept, tweak just a little bit. I'm using the idea, what you think of God or who God is, how you perceive God, what he is, will determine who you become. Every one of us has our own perceptions of who God is. And it's formed from every experience we've ever had, from who our parents are to our church. Our, our ch Some of you grew up in really strict church where no emotion was shown and I'll bet you, by your very nature, you tend to be more stoic, especially when it comes to God stuff. For you people in particular, you come to a church like this where people, is, where people are lively and there's, there's life and there's, you know, it, it seems to you it's almost irreverent. You grew up in a really strict home. No doubt you would view that God is up there taking count. And penning up everything you do, Rick. <laughs> Our perception of who God is, unfortunately, or realistically, we need to understand it, is from everyone, all of our life's collective experiences. I've prayed, God answered my prayer. God is good. I prayed, God didn't seem to answer my prayer. God has favorites. You all familiar with that, that picture of the six blind men? Look at the trons. You'll see it, six blind men. They're asked to describe what is an elephant. 
Now, we all know what an elephant is, but if you're a blind man and you've been given an assignment and that's what you feel, your perception, your experience tells you that, well, it's a wall. It's just this big, huge, that's what an elephant is. If you're up on the ears, you think an elephant is a fan. Big old floppy thing on the tail, you think it's a rope. The legs, you think it's a tree. It's a snake, the trunk, and the tusks. You think an elephant is a spear. It's amazing. All the different things. They say that our, our perception of God, for many of us, oftentimes comes from our father. If your father was unfair or abusive, you have the idea and the perception that God is probably unfair and kind of abusive. Maybe your father was, you could never please him, never was good enough. Your perception of God may very well be that God can never be pleased, it's never good enough. It could be the opposite. Some of you are raised with maybe such a pervasive father that, you know, he just didn't really care. If you came home at 11 o'clock at night, he didn't care. We, there wasn't really no curfew. You could just kind of do whatever you wanted to do. You could have the tendency to have a perception that God kind of really doesn't care about you, doesn't really care what you do. You're free to do whatever you want to do. It can be confusing. I would love to hear your description of God. Obviously, we don't have time. But even now, just sitting here looking at you, and I know, and I, you know, as I, as I see your face, it's like, I would love to know what you think your perception of God is. I'd love to hear you tell me what you think God is. Who is he? What's he like? I can tell you this. Whatever description you give me of who God is, I will bet 99 out of 100 times your perception of God is a lot like your personality. Because remember Mark Batterson's statement? He said, how you think about God will determine who you become. Think about that. Who you think God is and how you think about God determines who you become. If you're the stoic, serious kind of a personality, you tend to think, or we're brought up in that environment, that, that God is this awesome, and he is. But you don't ever mess with that picture, that perception of who God is. Okay, Doyle, I've picked on you all morning. Just out of curiosity, you'd have to do it kind of loud, and I'm not sure if this is even fair, but... When you think of God, how do you perceive God? Loving? Giving? Loving? Giving? No. Say that again. A giant laugh? Oh, a giant lap that you can just lay your head on and, and be in. It's really funny. I look at you, and I've just, I, I don't know each other really well, but... You are just this warm, wonderful person. It, you know, so, cause, and that's who you picture God is. Just this warm, loving. And those of you who know Doyle, he is a loving, giving kind of a guy. Your perception of who God is oftentimes is a reflection of your personality. Now, I don't know what came first your personality and you perceive God to be that, or you wrapped your, I think most of it, your personality kind of developed around your perception of who God is. Because when I was raised, um, I was raised in a church where I tell you, man, God was keeping track. And he had a book on me. It was bad. I, oh, he did, screwed up again. Mike, oh, he screwed up again. Mike, and, and I grew up in fear and all that. And I was really a shy quiet, kind of a, a fearful, timid kid. I know that you find that hard to believe. It's true, though. It really is. Until I got saved. Until I come to discover Jesus in a relationship with him. And now all of a sudden, I'm free. And I went from this, this being totally, you know, wrapped up 
in fear and confusion and, you know, hoping that God's gonna, not going to strike me dead. And someday I'm going to get an account of my life and I'm not sure. All this uncertainty. Now I know in whom I have believed. And I've been set free and there's this joy of knowing a loving Savior. And, and guess what my personality has become? Your perception of God. How you think of God will determine who you become. If God is a legalistic God to you, you are a legalistic person probably. God. Today, everybody, people are not afraid to talk about God today. Have you noticed that? They can talk about God. You believe in God? Oh, I believe in God. Oh, really? And sometimes you and I as Christians, we're naive enough to think and assume right away that they're talking about the same God you're talking about. And you find out that their God really is a doorknob. And you go, whoa. Whoa. Spin that around a little bit. Um, there were a lot of people, and it's a serious subject that people obviously think about it all the time. In fact, in theology, it's what, um, I'm not going to get the right term down right now. It's called, um, there's this innate knowledge of God that everybody has. The Bible says, put in every man is a knowledge of God. That pursuit to want to get to know who he is, is in us. But philosophers and theologians, in their effort to try to define and understand who God is, just by looking at the cosmos or at nature and at things, they've always missed the mark. Let me give you an example. Uh, Plato, he said, God is the eternal mind, the cause of good in nature. Kind of short, falls short. Aristotle, he is the first ground of all being. Sounds pretty heady, but mm, not so much. Spinoza, this is, this is a little long and heady, but listen, listen to this. He says, he is the absolute universal substance, the real cause of all and every existence. And not only the cause of all being, but itself all being, of which every special existence is only a modification. Sounds profound, but whoop, missed. Lebanitz. The final reason of things is called God. When you reason, you think things all out, and you finally come up with a solution, that's God. Kant, the great philosopher Kant, he said, a being who by his understanding and will is the cause of nature, a being who has all rights and no duties, the moral author of the world, you know, they were all trying to grasp a hold of who and define who God is. But they were all doing it apart from Scripture. Just from what they observed and what they could see. A geologist, Kirkley Mather, he says, God is a spiritual power. Imminent in the universe. Who is involved in the hazard of his creation. <laughs> Did you catch that? who's involved in the hazard of his creations. Basically, he says this. He says, God created a car, got out of it, and then got run over by it. <laughs> Henry Sloan Coffin says, God is that creative force behind and in the universe who manifests himself as energy, as life, as order, as beauty, as thought, as conscience, as love. Edward Ames, he thinks of God as Growing and as finite. Interesting. God has, he's, there's, there's, he's not all powerful. He's limited in his power. He's limited in his ability. That's how he sees God. But he started something that's going to keep going forever and ever. So basically he created something greater than himself. All these incredible things. Um, I think it was um, Bart. Uh, the the, the uh, theologian Bart, who says, you know, I believe that there's a God who created the universe, created all things, but he compared it like winding up a clock. He started the universe, got everything in motion, set it on a shelf, and now he's just going to let it take its course. While it's true, friends, all creation declares the glory of God, to get an accurate picture of who God really is, is impossible unless we choose to see how he chose to reveal himself to us. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these aspects. We're going to be looking at the Trinity, 
We're going to be looking at the nature of God. We're going to be looking at uh, what it means to be created in his image. If we can understand who he is, it'll be a lot easier to love him and to serve him, to honor him, to obey him. There's a saying that says, if you want men to create, build ships, you don't hand them a hammer and, and tools. What you give them is a love for the sea. And they'll build ships. Well, I keep thinking, we keep talking about loving God and serve God and God honor. I thought, you know, we're going to have a series about discovering a love for the sea, a love for God, and understanding really who he is. Because if we don't understand how he revealed himself in the scripture, we'll never really get to truly understand him. Because in the scripture is how he chose to, how he uh, really desired to reveal himself. And one of the ways, and we're going to talk about this, and then it's going to be time to go. In fact, it almost is already. So let let me just go quickly through this, is um, his name. How he allowed to reveal himself, even by the very nature of his name. In ancient writings, uh, the word for deity, uh, it was commonly used, was El. El, E-L, El, Hebrew, El. In the Greek, it's uh, Theos. In Latin, it's uh, Deus, or Deus. And in English, it's God. That's what we refer to, it's God. So God chose to reveal himself as deity, but even a little bit special. So God is referred to as El Elonai, El Elion, Elion. I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not getting graded on this though either, so. El Elion, which designates him as the highest, as the most high God. He's the most high God. That's how he chooses to reveal himself. Listen, there may be a lot of gods out there. I am the most high God. There is no other God besides me. El Shaddai. Some of you have heard that. In Hebrew, again, that little suffix at the end of El. I am the God Almighty. I am the Almighty God. There might be some mighty ones out there, but none mightier than me. I am the Almighty God. Jehovah. And Yahweh are words that are used in the scriptures a lot about God as he reveals himself as Jehovah or or Yahweh. What it means is the self-existent one. In the Greek, that's interpreted Lord. But in Hebrew, it really gives across the idea. He is self-existent. He doesn't need anything else. He doesn't need anyone else. He always was, always will be, and always is. Again, you get those little suffixes, and, and, and these are ways, and I think it's important to understand, and um, my wife, Pastor Orlean, did a whole Wednesday night series on the names of God, and they're important because God is how he chose to reveal himself, and how he allows himself, I think says volumes, because this is how he wants us to, to know him. When he says, I am Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide, he's basically, I am the kind of God who will provide for you. Hallelujah. I'm the God that will provide. He showed all through scriptures how he is the God who provides. He provides deliverance. He provides water out of rock. He provides manna out of heaven. He provides a way. Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord who heals. He basically revealed himself. I am the God who heals. And obviously with Jesus on the cross, Healing physicals is, is, is really pretty cool, physical healings. But I think at, at times the healing of the greatest healing of all, and that is of a sin-sick soul, can be healed and forgiven. Or how about the mind and the emotions and the will that get so damaged, Jesus comes and brings healing. Jehovah Nissa, Nisi, the Lord our banner. He's a banner over us. This is how we're going to be identified. It's his covering that is over us. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. Our God is a God that provides peace to those who will trust in him. That's how he chose to reveal himself. Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. 
He's not only going to provide for me, but he's going to lead me and he's going to guide me. He's going to watch out for evil around me. He's going to be there for protection. Not just to provide, but for protection. Then there is, and Pastor Bob had to help me out, and I'm still going to struggle at how to say this. Pastor Bob has got a hobby of the Hebrew uh, understanding. Um, he is uh, Jehovah Tzidkenu. 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 He said it much better. I give him an A. Um, it, it means the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Man, think about that. There's so much freedom in there. If we could truly understand the Lord is our righteousness, we keep trying to earn righteousness. He's a God who says, I am your righteousness. Jehovah Shama. The Lord is present. Yeah, I love that. You go more into the New Testament, uh, but well, even in the Old Testament, but Adonai means my Lord. Adonai, my Lord, Master. The name, Lord of hosts, Lord Almighty, Alpha and the Omega. The one who is, the one who is, who was and is to come. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. These are all names that he has allowed himself to be known as. We're told to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. To honor him, to serve him. But at times, I think we don't truly understand him. Who is he? I want to close with the natural course of relationships. Okay? The natural course of any relationship. Now, I'm going to use it in the, in the, in the realm of a, a man and woman, uh, but it could be in your coworker's situation. And um, like the dating is when you choose to be with a coworker, when you choose not to. The engagement period. Uh, you get to be... Um, regular friends, good friends that you are, you know, strong acquaintances with. But here's how, here's how the normal course of relationships are. You get some knowledge about somebody. Hey, Mike, did you, did you, do you know about that girl that's in third hour you know, in the class with you? Yeah, which one? You know, the one with the really, you know, big hair and looks like Farrah Fawcett. Yeah, I, I've noticed her. Yeah, well, she kind of likes you. Really? There's some knowledge. <laughs> hmm... I think I'm going to be a little more curious and get to know her a little bit more. So you, be, you get curious and you start, I'm going to start to find out, well, I wonder where she goes after this class. Hmm, wonder where her locker is. Oh, her locker's down in the sea bank over there. Really? Hey, best, hey, hey Mike, I saw you down in the sea bank in the lockers the other day. Well, yeah, I was just trying to check something out. <laughs> just checking it out. Acquiring knowledge. Do I like this? Do I not? I mean, just acquiring knowledge. And obviously the knowledge acquisition came to the point where, you know, I think I want to ask her out for a date. Hey, would you uh, like to go to the basketball game Thursday night? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I comb my hair. <laughs> I had a huge afro, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> My combing hair looked different than when you guys comb yours. I go showing up to her house. I go pulling in, and right on the post before I turn the corner in the driveway, it said a big sign that says, beware of dog. I thought, oh, this is great. She didn't say anything about a dog. So then I pulled up, and she lives in a duplex, and I wasn't sure which side she was go what to go to. I thought, this is great. I'm knocking on the wrong door. The dog's eating me alive. <laughs> this is going to be great. So I get to the right door. The dog doesn't eat me alive. And uh, so we go on our first date. And uh, so then the second night, uh, that was a Thursday night. So Friday night, uh, there was this Christian gathering of single people down at North Heights Lutheran Church. So I said, hey, you want to go up tomorrow night? We'll go down to that, you know, singles thing down at North Heights. And uh, she said, sure. So we dated. And then uh, it became just a regular thing. Hey, do you want to do it next Friday? And what are you doing Saturday? What are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing the next day? Hey, can I schedule out the rest of your life? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it got to be that you start dating, and you start dating enough, and again, this whole time you're acquiring knowledge, and now you're dating, and the next step in that relationship then is to think seriously about marriage, to get engaged. So I asked her to marry me, and she said, I'll think about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I asked her to marry me, and 
She said yes, and so for the next year, we were really getting to know each other even a little bit better as far as, you know, how do you handle finances? How do you, how do you view on this? What, how's your view on that? Uh, we were engaged for um, about a year. Uh, in fact, yeah, just a little over a year, mainly because of the situation. I was down at college, and she was up here um, in high school. No. We did get married really young. I'm trying to think. No, I proposed to her while she was still in high school. So she was an engaged student for the last two weeks of school. Um, okay, so, so we're engaged. And then we got married. So many people think that on this natural course of relationships, it stops at marriage. It doesn't. Well, for some it does, but it doesn't have to. See, after we got married, the next step is continued growth of intimacy. You see, I really knew her. They say love is blind, but marriage is a real eye-opener. I don't care how well you think you know somebody. Until you say, I do, you really don't. So there's that continued growth of intimacy as you begin to know and discover the other person. And, as, and as, that lasts a lifetime. You know, that same relationship happens with, with the Lord. But the knowledge acquisition part is, is key. It's foundational. What kind of knowledge are you getting of the Lord? Is it an accurate picture of who he really is? To understand that he's gracious and he loves you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to come in and live with you and be with you. He's an all-powerful God. But he's a personal God. He's far away, but yet he's very near. He's as close as the mention of his name. He holds the universe, the expanding universe, in the palm of his hand. Yet he has the very hairs of your head numbered. Our God is a great God. You know, as I think about that relationship, some of you, I know, are just in the process of acknowledge, gathering knowledge about the Lord. Some people have witnessed to you. They've talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're like, I'm not so sure about this. So you're just right now in the early stages of beginning to acquire some knowledge. Some of you, you've been dating for a while. Some of you, unfortunately, you've been at the state of being engaged, and you've been waiting for this engagement. It's lasting forever. You know, I, I remember dating the Lord. I dated the Lord. I, I remember, man, I was convinced. I knew the Lord. I've been in, I remember being in meetings and prayer meetings and stuff when I could sense the presence of the Lord was there. And I knew right away. I could say I knew the Lord. I knew him. I knew when he was there. I knew his teachings. I knew what he stood for. Why? Because I had gathered knowledge. I've been dating him for quite a while. But I really wasn't ready to get married. When I, when I came to that point in my life when I was really ready to get married, my engagement period was short. It was about an hour. I was at a meeting, and I heard the message, and I knew that tonight was the night. So I basically got engaged and got married the same day. I committed myself, forsaking all others, Lord, I'll give myself only unto you. And I got married. And since then, I've been growing, enjoying a growth of intimacy. You know, some of you... You're engaged. You haven't been married yet to the Lord. You like dating him. You're engaged. You've got a promise. You're convinced that someday you're going to give your life to Jesus. Someday. Well, someday. And the Lord is saying, will today be the day? I mean, when's the day? So, friends, here's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to close the service with a wedding ceremony. I'm going to give you an opportunity to move off your engagement to be married. I want to ask you to totally commit your life to Jesus Christ. And then you can continue on in this growth of intimacy, of knowing what Jesus is about, about and the intimacy of being in a relationship with him. You be here, and you're, gonna, you're saying, you know, I know the Lord, and, and you know. You know the Lord, but you have not yet surrendered your life. You've not really made that step of saying, Lord, I want to get married to you. I want to give my life to you. I want to live with you for the rest of my life. 